welcome you all to the final event of Anesthesia Week. Uh, I've been so excited waiting for this to happen because our speaker today is absolutely fantastic energy and presence, and we're so lucky to have her here. Um, and this week has been really phenomenal. It's an annual celebration of our department, Anesthesia Department's accomplishments, research, amazing projects, the collaborations that are happening both within our hospital as well as uh, beyond. And so it's just been a really wonderful celebration to be a part of this whole week. And combining with Anesthesia Week's annual celebration, is, this is also our monthly event from the Sadhguru Center for a Conscious Planet, where we host fantastic speakers and researchers and scientists from all over the globe to share about the incredible work that they're doing. And I know that there's a few people who may not have heard about Sadhguru Center before, so I went very briefly, want to just share um, a little bit about our center. We're a multidisciplinary research center based at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, which is a Harvard Medical School teaching hospital based in Boston. And uh, our center director is Dr. Bala Subramaniam, who is an anesthesiology professor at Harvard Medical School uh, and also a meditator, someone who's been meditating for a long time. And actually, the idea for the center came to him uh, right after a, an advanced meditation program. So a lot of the work that we're doing is really blending science and spirituality and seeing how these uh, can talk to each other and have a conversation to advance our understanding and experience of consciousness, cognition, and compassion. And we do this work through research, education, and outreach. We conduct scientific studies in various communities that better understand the impacts of yoga and meditation on health and wellness. Uh, we create educational opportunities like this one, where we have wonderful experts from around the globe in various disciplines come together to talk and share with us and also collaborate and innovate on health and well-being solutions. And uh, our outreach and community support work happens in the form of various types of programs, wellness programs to share tools of well-being to all of whom we can touch. So we're really excited that many of the team members on, in this photo are actually here today and online as well. And we're happy to connect with all of you who are on Zoom. And without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker for today and a topic that is very close to all of our hearts here at Sadhguru Center, which is lifestyle medicine for leaders. Uh, and we're really, really lucky to have Dr. Beth Freites talk a little bit about her work with us today. Uh, Dr. Beth Freites has been a collaborator of the center for a little over a year now and has been really inspiring us to do better work in uh, sharing the various aspects of lifestyle medicine with the world. Um, and I just want to share a little bit more about Dr. Freites here today. Give me one second to pull up my notes. <laughs> so Dr. Beth Freites is a trained physiatrist and a health and wellness coach with expertise in lifestyle medicine. She is an award-winning teacher at Harvard Medical School, where she is an assistant clinical professor. Dr. Freites is one of the first fellows of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and a pioneer in lifestyle medicine as well. She developed and taught a college lifestyle medicine curriculum at the Harvard Extension School in 2014, and is still one of the and this is still one of the most well-received courses offered at the school. She was also voted president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine in August 2020 and served as president elect until uh, last year. So, Dr. Freites has co-authored the Lifestyle Medicine Handbook, an introduction to the power of healthy habits, which I think we actually have here today. We have a couple copies right here. Um, and this book was ranked in the top 20 by Book Authority for medical books released in 2018. As Director of Wellness Programming at the Stroke Institute for Research and Recovery at the Spalding Rehab Rehabilitation Hospital, a Harvard Medical School affiliate, Dr. Freites has created and implemented a 12-step wellness program called Paving the Path to Wellness for patients as well as providers. And most re recently, she co-authored the book Paving the Path to Wellness Workbook, a guide to thriving with a healthy body, peaceful mind, and joyful heart. Since 2020, Dr. Freites serves as the Director of Lifestyle Medicine and Wellness for the Department of Surgery at Mass General Hospital, and in addition, Dr. Pretis has her own lifestyle medicine consulting and coaching practice where she sees patients one-to-one -one and in group settings. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Freitas to 
Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know it's Friday and I know it's five o'clock. <laughs> so let's make this uh, a joyful experience. Let's, let's make this impactful. And hopefully you're going to walk away with something that will be a tip or trick that can make you feel a little bit better, maybe enhance your well-being. I love the way this room is spread out here. A little bit makes me feel a little bit like, okay, we've got an audience. And I know you there. I'm, I'm talking to you out there. I think there's five or six of you. So thank you for being here. There's and um, and, and um, do I have a clicker? I don't know if I just, uh, can I use this one or? I think you can try. Terrific. Yeah. I do walk around. Um, and I, I like to go back and forth <laughs> right here to and from the, uh, Keyboard is perfect. So I do have some disclosures. I've been on the scientific advisory board for Jenny Craig for about 10 years and medical advisory board for clearing.com. I work on coaching. As Tulsi mentioned, I was a trained coach in 2008 and have been working in behavior modification since that time. And then I just have my own private practice. And um, I will just advance uh, to the next slide when I'm ready. And in part, there are six pillars of lifestyle medicine, interestingly, and one is stress reduction and resiliency. So um, we will use that as I, right, as I, as I move forward. We will talk about the six pillars. Does anyone have a guess as to what the six pillars of lifestyle medicine might be? Just a guess. Well, I told you one was stress resiliency, so I'm not gonna give that one to you. Exercise. Exercise. Sleep. Sleep. <laughs> Nutrition. Nutrition. These two are a little bit social interaction. <laughs> Positive social connection. Next one is hydration. Okay, but yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> so it's avoidance of risky substances. But but yes, hydration is really important. And by the way, we do have two books. Thank you so much for coming. Looks like you came maybe right from the, the right OR. From work. <laughs> oh, that's terrific. Thank you so much. Yeah, I get, get something to eat. Oh, we, do, you. We, do have, we do have two books here today that I do want to give away. So we will, we will do that um, through, through the presentation. And, um, I'm going to highlight the most caution book in the book. <laughs> well, and so the most oh, you know what? Is that? That's what you're back. You tell see, I don't know. So many people back. Okay. Pretty amazing. Thanks. Let's let's best parts with Seth. And then they have people online. Okay. okay. And I'm going to have one of Okay, perfect. So if everyone's on the same page, we're going to do a little bit of Okay, just so you know, all proceeds go to the American College of Life Science. And I'm not trying to sell this book for, for a profit. Um, talk about those those six pillars how they influence our body and then let's identify ways that the pillars influence each other you can already you're already starting to think about that right how lack of sleep might impact your nutrition how lack of sleep actually does impact your insulin sensitivity research shows us Five days sleep deprived, I don't know if you know what that even is defined as, but five days sleep deprived, 25% reduction in your insulin sensitivity, says studies. So all of this is important for ourselves and for our patients. Now, oh yes, Heather, please. Can I just speak into the microphone? Oh, for people to hear you online. I, I, can, I can be steady. It's not easy for me. <laughs> this is a challenge. Maybe I deserve a book. <laughs> okay. All right. No, I can, I can do this. So, um, right. So we will talk about how these pillars influence each other. You'll see as we go on. Oh, yes. I was explaining that this information about lifestyle medicine is powerful for you, your family members, your patients. So I, I do have to share two other things before we go on, which are when I was a resident at Spalding, um, we looked at survey of family physicians. We asked them, do you exercise? 
Do you counsel on exercise? Do you do aerobic training? Do you counsel on aerobic training? Do you do strength training? Do you counsel on strength training? And just for fun, nobody look, just look down. We're not judging here. By, by the way, this must be a place of no judgment, right? Because we're, we're a small group. Let's enjoy each other. No judging, no shame, blame, guilt. So do me a favor. You'll be able to see our goals. <laughs> oh. Okay, so can you close your eyes? <laughs> You're online. For a moment, close your eyes. If you don't mind, just play along with us. So I, I'd like to see if what I learned in 2000 when I was a resident is going to play out in this room, if you don't mind. All right, so do, do you exercise? I actually have, have to look if you don't mind, because I'm trying to see if there's the same correlation. Do you exercise? Okay. Do you counsel on exercise? Do you do aerobic training? Do you counsel on aerobic training? Do you do strength training? Do you counsel on strength training? Okay, interesting. What do you think we found in the survey when we asked family practitioners? Now, realizing you're all in anesthesia, so how much you're counseling, I mean, you're a hospitalist, so how much you're counseling the patients on lifestyle, I, I'm not sure anyway, but what do you think we found with family medicine? Who would be counseling on this, you would think, right? Those who don't do it. Say it again. Those who have never done it. Yeah, th those who have never done it, what do they do? They're intellectuals. They're intellectuals, right? So this is that they're counseling on it. All right. Any any other guesses? I we we actually thought that was going to be the finding. That's what we thought when we went into this. But but we found something different. Any anybody else? Remember, a book is at stake here. Raise those hands. What year was this? This was 2000. Okay. Oh, so they didn't counsel on it at all. Okay, didn't counsel on it at all. So I'm just representing Go ahead. an online member. Online member. Edgar Remoti says, Edgar. People, people counsel more than they do. Do as I say, not as I do. Oh, see, again, this is what we really thought. It's fascinating. Just so they, oh, I can't help us. And just so you know, this, this study has been replicated, I'm going to say five or six times in the two decades. And the same results, same results. And also, this is the study that I published that is the most cited study, which again, fascinates me. The whole thing fascinates me, but okay, let's get to it. If you exercise, you counsel on it. That's what we found out with these family docs. If you do strength training, you counsel on it. If you do aerobic training, you counsel on it. If you don't do strength training, you don't counsel on it. If you don't do aerobic training, you don't counsel on it. That's the correlation we found. And it keeps coming up like that. So for me, when I give talks like this, I realize that if I empower you to understand the benefits of exercise, nutrition, sleep, if I actually inspire you a little to do some of these things yourself, you may be more motivated and educated to help your patients, your loved ones, and others. So there's a lot to this, and it is a passion for me. It is my sole purpose. <laughs> and why is that? It has to do with a patient. Is anyone completely inspired by a particular patient some people, okay. So this, may I share the patient with you before we go? It is sort of a disclosure. Okay, people are saying no. No, they're saying yes. Okay, thank you for that. And um, so this is a patient that continue, I continue to think about. So this, uh, I'm a New Yorker, <laughs> and this is a New Yorker. Anybody from New York? And let's see online, if you're from New York, just type it in. No New Yorkers in the house. Woo! That's our very first time. There's no New Yorkers. How about in the Zoom room? New Yorkers? Yes. No. no New Yorkers in the house. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's got to be. We're everywhere. Yeah, you, you can't go anywhere without finding us. We're everywhere. All right. So, this... Yeah, I know the Yankees. I, I'm not... I, I, I go for the Red Sox. Uh, come on. I've been here since 96. Okay. So... This gentleman that I'm going to tell you about, overweight, overworked, New York City businessman, ate fast, walked fast, talked fast, sometimes did it all three at the same time, dined mostly on fast food or pretzels on the side of the road, right in New York, where you could get one of those cinnamon buns or the whatever there was out there that was a hyper palatable salt on top of sugar on top of fat. You know what I mean by a hyper palatable? Just consume that while talking, walking. That's his nutrition. Now, for sleep, he didn't do that. 
he worked pretty much 6 a.m. to 10, 30, 11 at night. And then during the night, he would wake up. He would not have a sound sleep. He would be waking up, thinking about his clients. He wasn't a physician. He was a man who took over his, his dad's business. So this was everything to him to make the second generation financial advising accounting company thrive. Clients were everything. He would make notes in the middle of the night. He'd go downstairs and chomp on kale? <laughs> no. Cookies, chips, yes. 2 a.m., 4 a.m. Get up at 6, get the train, go back to New York for the same repeat. Sometimes seven days in the week. Social connection, that's one of our pillars. He was married and had kids, but they loved him. He loved them, but there was no real connection. There was respect and honor and, and loyalty, and, but there was no real connection. And when he was present at home, when he was home, he wasn't actually present. The mind was always on the clients and the work. It, it was, it was you, you didn't feel, no one felt connected to him. And then risky substances, none. He didn't do any of that. He's too focused and busy to get that work done. And then what's our other pillar? Anybody know which one I'm missing? Pretty big one. Exercise, right. So he had been an amazing athlete in high school, basketball, soccer, baseball, shortstop. But he was 52, remember, at this time. No exercise, nothing. Sedentary lifestyle. And oh, that's not entirely true. So he did one thing. One thing, sporadically, never knew which day he would do it. Who knew what day he would do this thing? But I'll tell you, it happened the same time every day. The same time every day, but you didn't know what day he would do it. Any idea what this might be? Okay, if you get this right, and well, I got to stay here. If you get this right, and pretty much no one has ever gotten this right, and this is the patient that, that has sparked me and continues to inspire me. So if you get this right, you will get a book. Is that okay, Tulsi? That's not the rules we set up. Is this okay with everyone? If you get it right, okay, go for it. Do meditate. Say it again. Meditation. Meditation. Now that would be great. <laughs> that would be great. Oh, I forgot. Oh, thank you for bringing that up. Stress resiliency, eating, hard candies in his middle drawer at work, or yelling, sorry, or yelling, or not good coping. I had a similar lifestyle when I was doing my residency. <laughs> Sleep deprived, no, some exercise maybe, whatever food I could go. So I was there. You know this. Yeah. And you were going to have, you had something. You got to guess. Hmm? And, uh, well, sure, you can. Yeah. I think he will go to River Bank. Just so look at the river. Go so and look at the river. The mm -hmm. That is a that would also be very nice because he would true. walk and then he would be able to hear the sounds of the river. And that, again, that would be very good for stress relief. No, you cannot have the book, but it's a good idea. Oh yes. Do you you were gonna say? No idea. I, I, and exercise. Push ups. Uh, Push ups. Okay. No. Good try though. Running. Okay. Running. Oh, oh, tell, tell, see, what were you going to say? I was going to say it was online. What were Tell me what they said. Swimming? Because that's close. Oh, yeah. Swimming? No. Martial arts? No. Golf is parents. No. <laughs> Chasing the subway to get to work. Oh. Oh, oh wow. Oh. Oh. You won one of the books. Oh. Maybe you should announce it online. Oh. No way. So, so yeah. Leah, you just won. You just no way. You won. You are the the first winner. We still have another winner to go. But yeah. So, um, oh, sadly enough, it was sprints. You also won. Okay, wait, wait. I have more. I have more things. I have more things. No, I I have more things. These are Harvard Health. These are Harvard Health. Oh, almost everyone can get one. Okay, everyone's gonna be a winner. Oh, thank God. I feel so much better. This
this was for some other group, but I, I like you guys. And you're, you're, you're here on Friday, so you should get this, not the other group. I'll get, I'll get more for them. All right. So, so, but seriously, back to this gentleman, because it's quite a tale. So he would, at 11.07, sprint to catch the last train home to Scarsdale, New York, the fast train. And on one of these mad dashes, what happened? Little pressure. No pain, no gain. Forge forward made the train. Then numbness tingling. You know the story. Elephant wife, who is a teacher, comes to pick him up at the airport. I mean, at the at the train station, like she did dutifully. She looked at him, and he was pale, short of breath, sweaty. Took him right to the ER, where he did complete his massive myocardial infarction, and then subsequent, unfortunately, middle cerebral artery infarct leaving him paralyzed on the left side at the age of 52. So that was a story and a life that I saw and said, this cannot happen again. This should not happen. This, this must stop. Fortunately, I can tell you that he made a complete recovery, except, of course, for fine motor movement of the left, of the left hand. But he made a complete lifestyle change. He went to something called Pritikin. It's a forefather of ours in lifestyle medicine, Nathan Pritikin. He was actually a chemist, a physicist, but he had a heart attack at a young age and he wanted to learn what to do to prevent it. And he was one of the first ones to say exercise and diet can make a big impact. And he published a lot of studies. Then he opened centers where people, if you knew about it, like my dad, the New Yorker, oops, <laughs> and that, that's how I know it so well, because that story happened when I was 18 and that is my dad. And so since that day, I've been on this journey, on this path, and it wasn't called lifestyle medicine in 1987. It was just called an infarction and a stroke uh, and figure it out. So he learned about healthy eating and exercise and stress reduction. And I watched this man transform. He transformed in every way in these six pillars, even though I didn't even know these were six pillars. I was 18. I turned from economics because guess who was going to take over the company? <laughs> and follow in daddy's footsteps. Mm. And that all changed to economics, to pre-med and psychology and biology. And learning, for me, stress, it's funny because you guys mentioned stress reduction, right, when we talked about exercises. And I had this feeling, something about stress with him in the 80s. Now, Herb Benson, thank goodness, was doing great work here already. In New York, ah, <laughs> stress, eh, you know, it doesn't really impact the heart. Well, Rosansky and colleagues in New England Journal, they published a study in 1988 that showed mental stress, that would be serial sevens, you know, subtracting serial sevens, or giving a public speech in front of people, I guess a little bit like what I'm doing now, um, in cardiac patients caused wall motion abnormalities and EKG changes in these cardiac patients that were similar to those that they found when they were doing their physical stress test. So I read that in 1988, I'm just a little pre-med at Harvard. And I said, this is like gold. What, this is critical. This is so essential to this heart condition. So then I, I replicated it and that was my senior thesis. And, and then I went to Stanford and started looking at nutrition. And we studied diets high in L-arginine so like walnut rich diet, because that, that then goes to nitric oxide, as you know, can relax the blood vessels compared to saturated fat diets. And sure enough, what did we find? Of, of, of course, those that are high in L-arginine were endothelial cells were healthier. At any rate, long story to tell you that after writing, going through residency, writing a book about preventing a stroke, how to prevent a second stroke, there was no literature there. Of course, this is near and dear to my heart. We needed to, I feel, educate people how they can prevent a second stroke. So I dove into that literature, dove into nutrition. I didn't learn it at Stanford Medical School. How many people learned nutrition in medical school? Anybody online? No, nobody. Exercise in medical school? Stress resiliency? Nothing at Stanford. And I love Stanford. It's a great medical school. I, I loved it. I think it's, it's an amazing place to, to study, but I didn't learn any of that. So since that time of writing that book, which would be 2006, this has been my quest to learn everything about these six pillars, to, to put them in a format where people can, oh, somebody has the book, people can read a book, enjoy it, have clinical cases, 
take it home, digest it, and live it. The thing is to live it. That's what I'm hopeful for. So when Tulsi gave me the opportunity to actually talk to all of you and go through these pillars, I, I was so excited. What is lifestyle medicine? We're going to define it. You already know the six pillars. Do you know this? Anybody? Okay. Oh, anybody. You can already answer. And if you can answer after, you can get a book too. This is a self-care book that Harvard Health put together with me for that Paving the Path to Wellness program that Chelsea was talking about. They put it together in a self-care book. So it's all about the six pillars um, and how you can care for yourself with, with Harvard Health. So does anyone know, and do not Google this, especially the young people that are so good at Googling. Am I a kind that influences the brain, liver, pancreas, and bone? Anybody know? All right. Why do we care about SCFAs? Anybody know what those are? Nice. Okay. Why do we care about them? They're not good. They're not good. Okay. We're going to keep this. I get to keep this. Um, can you name 14 stress reduction techniques supported by the medical literature? We had two that were, that were already shared. Okay. Well, we'll see. Being awake 18 hours, reaction time is similar to someone with a blood alcohol concentration of, okay, again, you're so close to getting this, so close, <laughs> soft by decimal or something. Okay, do you know seven ways low social connections are connected to poor health? Seven ways, okay. What are the AHA and CDC recommendations for alcohol consumption? I know someone in this room knows this. The American Heart Association recommendations or the CDC recommendations. Yes, yes, you know. Go ahead. Right. Two drinks a night. Okay, a little more. A little more detail. Okay. Okay. And this passes down to the gentleman in the back. Thank you so much. Terrific. What's that? <laughs> you knew the med, that's okay. All right. Now, what is lifestyle medicine? So excited to tell you about this because mm, back in 2008, we started the first lifestyle medicine interest group at Harvard. And now there are 81 in medical schools. You know, there's about nine, um, 190, you would know probably better, but we're almost halfway there. With, um, with medical school. So it's very exciting. And now we're an actual specialty where we have a board certification. I wrote the questions, <laughs> me and three other people. I'm, I'm such a nerd, I love it. I get so into the research. Anyway, so you can be board certified in this now as of 2018. Anybody here board certified online? Board certified. Oh, sorry, in lifestyle medicine. Online, any? Planning to. Oh, here, you've got another book. No. Um, all right. So lifestyle medicine is a medical specialty that uses therapeutic lifestyle interventions as a primary modality to treat chronic conditions, including but not limited to cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, such a hot topic. Lifestyle medicine certified clinicians are trained to apply evidence-based whole person prescriptive lifestyle change to treat and when used intensively, often reverse such conditions. Applying the six pillars, what are they? A whole food, plant predominant eating pattern, physical activity, restorative sleep, stress management, avoidance of risky substances, and positive social connection also provides effective prevention for these conditions. So the six pillars in a nutshell, you will get a book if you can answer yes to these questions. Ready? I'm gonna give you the guidelines in case you have to go early. So you're gonna get some really important material right here, please. Being healthy. Yes. You got you 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 win that one. Yeah. Oh, we're gonna go over what it means. Oh, Is that, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So for, for we're gonna we're gonna actually get into short chain fatty acids, we're gonna get into veggies, we're gonna get into the diet, we're gonna get into the Harvard Healthy Plate and why that plate looks like that. One of my good friends is Dr. Walter Willett, mentor and just amazing human being as he is in nutrition field. Exercise. Does anyone know the recommendations for exercise? Just curious. 30 minutes five days on intensity or um, aerobic exercise. Yeah, so, yep, so, so yes. United States Health and Human Services in 2008 put together after evaluating 6,832, I don't know, something like that, 6,800 something studies. They put these recommendations in place accumulate 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity in the week. Moderate intensity means you can talk, but you cannot sing. If you can sing, you're in low. If you cannot talk, you're in vigorous. So if you're doing vigorous already, you only need 75 minutes of vigorous intensity. 
physical activity in the week. So my question is, and you can now, now we're hopeful that you raise your hand and keep your hand raised. If you raise your hand and keep your hand raised throughout these six questions, which are the guidelines, you will of course also get a book. So if you are doing that, accumulating 150 minutes of modern intensity, raise your hand. And if you're online, okay. So we have, well, we have a lot of contenders in the room just in case you're on Zoom and you don't see us. Now, um, strength training twice a week. If you're doing that, keep your hand up, okay? Once your hand goes down, the surgeons always try to get me on this. Once your hand goes down, no, you cannot put it back up. So this means you need to keep your hand up the whole time. And then if you can keep it up because you are able to say yes. Um, and of course, this is, you know, you're being honest. There is a buzzer that will buzz though under your feet if you're, if you're not. Nutrition, are you consuming five servings of fruit and vegetable, not five vegetable, five fruits, say two fruit, three veggies, five total servings of fruit and vegetable each and every day of the week. Okay, all right. Sleep, seven to nine hours every day of the week. I lose the surgeons like that. Okay, look, I got some anesthesiologists in the room. All right. Stress management, you practice 20 minutes a day of stress resiliency, a practice. Now, okay, um, you can put your hand up and then down. That indicates you're on that pillar. I see that happening. That's terrific. Social connection, are you connecting once a day or a total of seven times in the week with someone that you have a high quality connection with? Mm -hmm. Last one, you don't smoke, you don't drink, or if you drink, it's only one for a woman in a 24 hour period. The Europeans always ask me, is lunch count and dinner? No, it's one in the 24 hour period. Um, or two for the man, as we say. Okay, so who 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 has the hand up? If you've already won a book, <laughs> I think or two. Okay, so and online, how many? How many? Like are? Two or oh, one. We're just one. Yeah, they got to yeah. be honest. And yeah, be honest. Okay, two, of them. Two, two, two of them. Two of them. Two. Yeah. All right. So be honest, because we. We're, we're, I, I don't. I don't left after this. <laughs> there, there's no other tricks in the bag. All right. So. Why is this so important? You you guys know about exercise. I We don't need to go through all the benefits. You know it would take 11 medications to give you all the benefits of exercise. For those of you that exercise, why do you exercise? Just yell it out and, and type it in if you exercise. Why do you exercise if you exercise? I know you exercise, Nancy. I know you do. It feels good. It feels good, exactly. It feels good. Anybody else? Why do you exercise? Productive. Makes you feel productive. Goal. Works towards a goal, and you feel you get that goal and dopamine release. You feel good. Yeah. Anything else? Question though about okay. exercising. You mentioned that you can't sing. That's and that. then you can't talk. So where does swimming come into it? Oh, that's a great. Yeah. Okay. So that that's such a great question. So. So where does swimming fit in? If if because you're not talking at all when you're under the water, so you'd you'd have to use um, your heart rate, two twenty minus age. That's your max. Um, and then um, if you're doing about seventy percent of your max heart rate, so you you have to check your heart rate. And if you're doing seventy percent, you'd be in the moderate. If you're doing like ninety, you're in vigorous. If you're doing in the fifty percent range of your maximal heart rate then you're going to be in low I mean, so you'd have to you'd have to check your heart rate yeah, i do okay perfect so it's 220 minus age is max and then the percentage of that max okay. um great question <laughs> that's a great no one's ever asked that imagine that's and i've been doing this for over a decade okay so looking at recent research this is from 2020 why did i say the aerobic and the strength training even in 2000 when we asked the primary care physicians we we knew there was some magic to that strength training and we're going to talk exactly about about why it's essential especially after the third decade but it's essential because it gives us protection if you look at this study it is about a half a million people population based cohort looking around 9 years of follow up checking death records in 59819 and this is self report of the aerobic activity and the strength training. And uh, if you look on the x-axis, you see insufficiency, muscle strength training, aerobic, and then both, both physical activities. Now you have all-cause mortality and looks like purple, cardiovascular disease, still our number one killer in yellow, cancer, 
in the pink and teal is chronic lower respiratory tract disease. When you add muscle strength training, you, you, you certainly go down in your risk of mortality. If you just add one thing, either strength training or aerobic training, you can see if you add aerobic, you have a greater reduction in mortality with aerobic training. So if someone says, well, which one's more important? And well, if you're looking at reducing your risk of death, then you'd say aerobic. But what's the best thing to do? Both, both aerobic and physical, aerobic and strength training. Now, no one here looks like they're over 30. When you hit the decade of 30, you start to lose muscle mass. Research shows us between this, I used to say three to 5%, but I just saw a study that said you could be losing 8% every decade after the decade of 30. Meaning by the time you're 50, you may have lost 10% of your muscle mass. Why is this important? Because we wanna stay functional, active and independent until we are 90, 100, and we are going to need our muscles to help us do that. All right. Question from online. Go ahead. Can you comment on the new large study published by the AMA on exercise guidelines? So um, the guidelines were uh, 2008 guidelines. Then in 2018, guidelines were revisited. The only change in those guidelines was to accept five-minute bouts of exercise. Now, there has been recent research, and maybe the JAMA article they're talking about is if you do bursts of exercise, you don't have to accumulate 150 minutes. If you do bursts of sprint training, you could just do five minutes of burst training, and you keep doing that over seven days. And so there, you're only accumulating 35 minutes. That may be able to reduce your mortality. And that's a newer version of using exercise to reduce mortality. And everybody loves this newer version of what we call exercise snacks because it's less time. Now, I don't know that we, hey, we don't yet have years of, of, of research and data to, to tell us if these short bursts of activity will pan out. So it's, I'm for it. Sprint up and down the stairs. Here's the problem. Don't go from sedentary behavior to sprinting because who did that? my dad, and who does that? The people that end up having heart attacks. So, so you must, if you're going to do vigorous, you must work up to it, especially if you're sedentary. So the reason I exercise, and you're not surprised, and no one else has ever said this, and, and I have asked multiple, multiple audiences, I exercise for my endothelial function, but that doesn't surprise you at all. I literally am thinking about my endothelial function and how I want to have healthy blood vessels, brain and heart. That's uncommon. Most people say exactly what you guys said, but I wanna share with you, your brain loves the gym. I wanna to talk to you about dopamine being released, improving motivation, focus, and learning. Serotonin being released, enhancing mood. Did you know, just, I don't wanna bore you, that there are studies comparing antidepressants to exercise. Yeah, so this is how we actually release serotonin. Endorphins are released, by the way, I get it when I do jogging, running, and I get it from yoga. People, I read a couple years ago, I learned this was new to me. You may not get an endorphin rush from running, ex exercise. You may get it from stretching, though. Some people get endorphin release from stretching, so try it. Uh, norepinephrine, released, improving attention, perception, and motivation. And then BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Is it, has anyone heard of that before? So that is released, protects and repairs neurons from injury and degeneration in physiatry stroke, of course. We're doing physical therapy. We're working, working, working to get movement and exercise to increase this BDNF. Now, did you know you can change the structure of your brain with exercise? So people that exercise, studies have been shown multiple since 2015. This is actually not new, but oddly it's new to, to academic audiences and to physicians. It's new that your hippocampus can increase in volume with exercise. Your hippocampus can increase in volume with, it, with exercise. Fascinating. So that, if you are thinking about dementia, and we have obesity, diabetes, and dementia epidemics, right? How is it? Well, that's the myokine I asked you about, and it's called irisin. So when we exercise, irisin is released. If you can see here um, on, the, on the diagram, I, I think I have a pointer. Okay. Um, Yep, I think, can we see this? Yep, 
So irisin is released. It does combine with BDNF, which we just went over, which is also released with exercise. And as you can see with STAT3 signaling, this is where we could potentially get that hippocampal proliferation. It is irisin combining with BDNF that helps with neuroplasticity and neurogenesis, and that is going to help decrease Alzheimer's disease risk. Now, this is the question I asked you on our initial slide, which myokine, the answer is irisin, has an impact, a positive impact on muscle, adipose tissue, pancreas, bone, brain, and liver. Specifically, I'm going to combine the pillar of physical activity and nutrition and share with you that irisin is known to have an impact on appetite regulation to help curb cravings. You've heard, you've probably felt when you exercise, you don't have as many cravings. And research shows this, bears this out. But now what I love about lifestyle medicine is you stay up to date. This was not known when I was in the field in 2008. We did not know. I did know this because I've been running for years. I did know this part, just I knew it in, internally. Then research showed us that other people were reporting it and then they had cohort studies. And now we're getting to the mechanism. And that's what's so exciting about lifestyle medicine. Sedentary physiology, you've all been sitting for a little while. If you want to stand, go ahead because we've known this since 2015 as well. There's something called sedentary physiology where your lipoprotein lipase decreases, your triglycerides thus increase, HDL can decrease, and glucose control is disrupted. This is why the American Diabetes Association recommends that people with prediabetes or diabetes stand up every half an hour. Everybody else, that's us, and then everyone in this room, in the Zoom room, needs to stand up every hour. Now, look, I was just at the Thich Nhat Hanh um, opening center extravaganza on Wednesday. You probably heard about this. There's now a meditation center, uh, a mindfulness center at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And we were sitting, we were sitting. You go to these conferences and you sit and you sit and you sit. Uh, whenever you go to a CME conference, you're sitting for hours. We must remind ourselves to stand up every hour. Fortunately, this lecture is only an hour, so you will be standing in an hour. Now, nutrition. Here we go. What is a healthy diet? This is the question everybody has, honestly. This is just the question of the day. At, well, actually, it's the question of the year, the decade. But it's been a decade since we've actually known the answer to this, and it has not changed. And research bears this out time and time again. This is a good friend of mine at Yale, Dr. David Katz. He was a former president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. I love the way his mind works. So look, there's this different diets, discrepancies, and, and, and individual differences. So he says, okay, low carb, low fat, vegetarian, vegan, low glycemic, Mediterranean, mixed, balanced, paleolithic. Now put keto in there, okay, instead of paleolithic. Now we can also be keto and vegan. We know this. All right, but the point is every one of these eating patterns, I like to call them eating patterns, really not necessarily diets, but these eating patterns do have health benefits. So what are the compatible elements? What do we pull together and say, well, this is healthy eating? This is a healthy eating pattern. Let's go. Here it is. Limiting refined starches and added sugars. No one argues about this. Limiting processed foods. No one argues about this because the research shows us the more processed foods you have, the more likely you are to die. We know this. We know sugar increases inflammation. Inflammation is the root cause of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, metabolic syndrome. So Limiting certain fats, trans fats, of course, saturated fats. That's still what the American Heart Association, what, what uh, the cardiology, uh, American Cardiology Association says. And then emphasis on whole, whole plant foods. Here's where we get nuanced, with or without lean meats, fish, poultry, seafood. Now, I look to the gurus. Dr. Walter Willett has been studying this for 30 years or more. He's at the School of Public Health. So he says... Fish can give you omega-3 fatty acids. Be careful with the, with the mercury levels. So don't eat the big fish. Okay. If you want to go that route. Poultry, he calls neutral. Okay. Red meat, still American Heart Association and others. You want to limit red meat. American Cancer Society. I was just looking at it today. I was giving a talk to, to um, other students, um, residents. American Cancer Society, limit red meat. You know that processed red meat has been connected to cancer. So this is what the data shows. You, you, you understand the data, you have the data, and then you make your choices. Now, who said food, eat food, not too much, mostly plants? Anybody know? Michael Pollan. That's still true. Why? Why do we focus so much on plants? Because that's where the data has been, and it continues to be for over a decade, 15 years worth of really big, strong, solid research. Here's a meta-analysis of cohort studies following, again, half a million participants found that 
a higher intake of fruit and vegetables associated with a reduced risk of death from cardiovascular disease. Average risk reduction of 4% for each additional serving per day of fruit and vegetable. It's a decade old. We, we, we know this. We should be taking this in and really absorbing it. And guess what? 90% of Americans are fruit and vegetable deficient. They are not getting the five servings. Nurses study. Compare with those in the lowest category of fruit and vegetable intake. So that's less than 1.5 servings a day. I want to ask you, don't say anything out loud. You don't have to. How many servings are you getting per day? Those who averaged eight or more, and now you know how many I strive to get because I love data and I love research and I, I follow research. So those who average eight or more servings a day were 30% less likely to have a heart attack or stroke. This is decades of research, right? We've known this for decades. Individuals who ate more than five servings of fruit and vegetables per day had roughly a 20% lower risk of heart disease and stroke compared with individuals who ate less than three servings per day. This has been known for so long, but we're not taking action on it. Now, what else is in the fruit and vegetable? Fiber. Do you know we are fiber deficient as a nation? We are fiber deficient. WHO recommends 25 to 29 grams of fiber each day. Why? It lowers the incidence of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and colon cancer. How? This is where we met the SCFAs, the short chain fatty acids, because when we eat fiber, our microbiome ferments it. What does that mean? It creates acetate, propionate, and butyrate. Why do we care? Because these short chain fatty acids are positive. They play key roles in regulating our host metabolism, immune system, and cell proliferation. Dive deeper into this. Again, why I love this so much, because you can go to this journal article from 2019 and really get into this. Dietary fiber, gut microbiome, ferments it, creates short-chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, butyrate, goes into the L-cell. Then you have increased L-cell proliferation, increased proglucagon, increased GLP-1, increased PYY. And what's this? Regulation of energy metabolism, glucose metabolism, lipid metabolism, inflammation, helps with immunity, and helps us reduce our risk of cancer. Powerful. This is fiber. This is what fiber can do for us. Now, stress reduction techniques. You all are masters at this, but you know, let's go ahead and see if I can give you something new. These are 14 evidence-based stress reduction techniques for you to try. This is getting out in nature. By the way, there are recommendations to get out in nature 120 minutes per week. Exercise. We know this reduces stress, so we know how. Mindfulness. Mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is John Kabat-Zinn from UMass uh, Worcester. As you know, he was actually, I saw him on um, Wednesday. Amazing. Um, meditation. You know this very well. You can find this with neuroimaging. Playing with pets releases what? That helps us to relax. Anybody, anybody? Playing with pets releases a neurochemical, okay, endorphin, close enough, oxytocin. So this oxytocin bonding hormone makes us feel good. And this is a great, this is why the, the puppy play dates are full at Countway. You know this, there's puppy play dates and they fill up. You can't get one next week, I'm sure, because all the medical school students have already signed up and the faculty taking your vacation. People think, oh, I, I won't be productive. Shows actually you're more productive when you come back and you reduce your stress. What else? Taking deep breaths. You all are masters of this, and this is the best way to turn on our parasympathetic system. And I might say something with eating. Let's combine these. Take 10 deep breaths before you eat. Get yourself into the parasympathetic system so you can actually absorb the nutrients that you're putting into your mouth. Actually take the time, sit down, mindfully eat your meal. Music, any kind of music, medical students use this number one <laughs> form of stress reduction, any kind that you like. Yoga, I love that you're all doing research on that. Laughter, expressive writing. We have Dr. Suzanne Coven over at MGH who's been doing expressive writing with physicians, especially through COVID. It's good results that show it can reduce anxiety. And then something simple like chewing gum may do it. Something less simple, checking email less frequently. Getting control of your email will obviously reduce your stress. One of my mentors, Charlie Hatem, does anyone know him? Yeah, my amazing man. So I met him when I was at Stanford and, and come in and looked at, at internships here. And met, he was at Mount Auburn at the time. Anyway, he uh, told me, Beth, the email can't run your life. Check it at nine, at 12, and five. Look, you've got your phone. They'll call you, they'll text you. They know how to get a hold of you. But if you're constantly reacting to your email, you're not going to be in creative mode. You're not going to be productive. You're just going to be reactive, reactive, reactive. So this actually changed me in a, in a very significant way. 
Another aspect of life that stress can impact, mm, we know this, sleep. Who gets seven to nine hours of sleep? Okay, it's very common in, in, in the medical circles. We need to pay attention to the data. Do you know the AHA, American Heart Association, added something to their essentials for years, decades? They had the essential seven. You know this or no? They had the essential seven, and it's every, everything you think. Exercise, healthy diet, control your blood pressure, control diabetes. What did they add to make essential eight? They just added April 2022. They added sleep. They honor sleep. We honor sleep as a major pillar. American College of Lifestyle Medicine, American Heart Association now honors it as a major pillar because look at all the data around it. So hazard ratio of incident CVDs on the y-axis, sleep duration on the x-axis. The sweet spot right here, seven to nine hours. Now, if you want to be in a sleep-deprived study, you will have less than six hours and Charles Seisler will accept you into the sleep deprivation arm of his study. Sleep deprivation will cause high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, and diabetes. Here's the answer to the question that you almost got right. Driving while drowsy is a serious danger, and research in it has helped us to understand how important sleep is for our reaction time. Very important for surgeons, people in anesthesia, anyone driving a car, and this was done in Australia. Being awake 18 hours, your reaction time is similar to someone who has a blood alcohol level of 0.05. Being awake 24 hours, your reaction time is similar to someone who has a blood alcohol concentration of 0.10 and legally drunk is 0.08. Very important to make your sleep a priority. Create a cave, quiet, get earplugs, get white noise, pink noise, rain, uh, ocean, river, make it cool. Sweet spot is 67 degrees. Why? Because a drop in core body temperature is a signal for sleep. What else is a signal for sleep? Melatonin release from the pineal gland. How that's blocked when you have blue wavelength light from screens, from your phone, from the television. So get blue wavelength blocking goggles, get an app that stops the blue wavelength from your computer, from your phone, or just shut it all down two hours before bed if you can, and don't sleep with your phone. Your choice, but you now you know when you're exposing yourself to this blue wavelength light, it goes to the retina, goes to the pineal gland. Pineal gland says, no melatonin for you. Nope. And you want that melatonin, not in pill form, not in supplement form, but naturally from your pineal gland. Poor sleep can impact mood, outlook, productivity, creativity, sociability, relationships, and that's our next pillar. Did you know that when you're sleep deprived, you are 30% more likely to have an amygdala flare? Matthew Walker's work, he used to be here at Harvard with Charles Seisler, he's now in California. That's Matthew Walker's work. Do you know what amygdala flare is? You're irrational, you lose control, your amygdala responds to a threat. It's not really a threat, but you believe it's a threat. So you're just irrational. And people are trying to calm you down and you just don't see anything. Usually this happens with kids. <laughs> In terms of physicians, this does not usually happen at work, but sometimes somebody else is having an amygdala flare at you and you are trying to rationalize with them, nothing's getting through. Their amygdala is speaking to you. So don't, don't bother. Now's not a good time, Nancy, like you would ever have a flare. That's hysterical thinking of you having to make no flare. But anyway, now's not a good time, Nancy. Let's talk another time. That's all you can do. I mean, there's no rationalizing with these people. With sleep, you won't, you're less likely to have one. Now, you know this. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Physiologic needs, water, and uh, food, shelter. And then what's after water, food, and shelter? Love and belonging needs. We need each other for our health. This is the question I asked, the seven ways low quality and quantity of social ties can impact us. Development, something near and dear to my heart, development and progression of cardiovascular disease. One might say dad was pretty lonely. He was just with his numbers, right? Recurrent heart attack, atherosclerosis, high blood pressure, cancer, delayed cancer recovery, slower wound healing. All of this is linked to low social ties. And we've known this since 1979. Lisa Berkman was in Alameda County and with her colleague, Leonard Syme, she's now Lisa Berkman studying here at the School of Public Health in the same area, social connection. She did this landmark study showing that people of all ages and men and women, they are in their 30, 49, 50, 59, 60, 69, same for, same for women on the x-axis, y-axis is percentage that died from all causes in their nine-year study. And guess what? These bar graphs show least connection in the diagonal lines. And then, then there's some connection and then most connection. The highest bar graphs in all age groups in men and women, so those most likely to die, are those with the least connections. This is serious. 
And now with COVID, we are taking it more seriously. Jane Dutton has spent her lifetime studying this and figuring out how to create high quality connections. They have more emotional carrying capacity. That means when you're in a high quality connection, you can express more emotion, both positive and negative, and their safety feel it in, in, in doing this. It's like the psychological safety Amy Edmondson talks about from Harvard Business School. If you're not familiar with her work, it's very powerful, but you feel safe saying, that hurt me, Nancy, when you mentioned that. I, I felt hurt, I felt disappointed, I felt sad, I felt frustrated, I felt unheard, I felt unappreciated, I felt unseen. All these things that we keep bottled up in our head, we don't express it to the loved one or the person we wanna have a high quality connection with. They don't know, they, they don't, people don't have mental telepathy. You must express these things to have a high quality connection and no one's perfect. No relationship is perfect. In a high quality connection, you need the ability to bounce back after setbacks. Key part, the third part, relationships have generativity, openness to new ideas and influence, as well as, as its ability to deflect, very important, deflect behaviors that will shut down generative processes. What kind of behaviors shut down growth in a relationship? When someone does what to you, you feel, oh, this isn't gonna work. When people shout at you, yelling, threatening, screaming at you that that is that is not going to help growth how about bullying how about lying cheating how about silent treatment how about avoidance how about going behind your back how about saying one thing to your face doing something different you think oh this doesn't happen we learned this in kindergarten this is what we learned to do in the sandbox to be honest and respectful and a person of integrity unfortunately his behavior still happened so we need to pay attention and focus in on the basics. Almost done. This is really important. I told you since COVID, people are looking at social connection and loneliness. In this recent study in Diabetologia, we have 20 year follow-up, 4.9% of the study participants developed type two diabetes. Varying degrees of feeling lonely were reported by 12.6% of participants. Here's the key. Individuals who felt most lonely had a two-fold higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes relative to those who did not feel lonely. We should ask our patients, our friends, our family, ourselves, do you feel lonely? Do you feel connected? This is simple. We're done. Quit smoking. It's not simple, actually. It's, it's one of the hardest things we have to do in lifestyle medicine, and we have to counsel about substances. But we know, we know these guidelines. Here, though, what is one drink? That's the trick. 12 ounces of beer, 8.9 fluid ounces of malt liquor, five ounces of wine, 1.5 ounces of shot of 80 proof spirits. That's one for a woman, two for a man. AHA says, if you don't drink, do not start. CDC says, if you don't drink, do not start. Cancer prevention, no alcohol is safe. That, was, that came out again in Lancet 2023, you probably saw this, where alcohol is considered a group one carcinogen. The only other thing I'll say before I finish is that alcohol is connected to these pillars in many, many ways. It disrupts sleep. You think it helps you fall asleep and it may help you fall asleep, but it's going to wake you up around two or so and it's gonna disrupt your REM sleep. Many people wake up and cannot get back to sleep. You put the EEG monitor and you guys know this probably better than anyone. This has an impact on your brain alcohol as you sleep. And that's it really, this goal setting, hopefully you have goals. That's all this is about that you have for yourself after hearing this and after being on this journey with me through a whirlwind of lifestyle medicine. I do hope that you took something new away from this and that you'll stay connected with me. Perhaps I'll be hopefully here at the center still and, and maybe have an opportunity to connect with you again and be more than happy to take questions. So um, thank you so, so much. These are all the references and coming up. Um, I was curious, that, yes. uh, unless I missed it, yeah. in your stress management, you didn't talk about cognitive behavioral. Yeah, methods. that is amazing. And therapists will be doing that, right? Mostly. We, I, I don't do much cognitive behavioral therapy. I'm not trained in it personally. As a lifestyle medicine professional, we don't get trained in that. But we certainly refer out all the time, all the time. I guess for me, is doing work. Oh. So that the online people can engage. So with your sorry. Question. Okay. So cognitive behavioral therapy is the question, and that is a central way to manage stress. And, and we recommend people go to a therapist and, and get help with that. 
I guess my experience is really different and oh, good share a really important part of the clinician patient interaction yes both for sleep disruption but also for helping people to deal with stress there's just very simple suggestions yep can be made I guess I've just always found that to be real yeah do you want to share like for example what are you thinking in terms of helping people to yeah the cognitive behavioral therapy that you're doing for blood pressure, it's getting people to see racing mind or to be able to see automatic thoughts and yeah. about how you awfulize. It just Wonderful. in the exam room when you're taking blood pressure, getting people to really even understand that you come in here so worried about what yeah. to see that your pressure is 50 points higher. Right. So when I've seen people, I get them to try and just even name that. Beautiful. It, breathe. So... And we just started, I was working with someone helping to put this in, in the incarcerated setting for wow. people that couldn't sleep. So just really simple things to stop mind racing. So I- That's terrific. I think that's fantastic. It's just simple. Yeah, I, I, I love that. About it at the therapist level, I'm talking just- I see. Yeah, I love that. And thank you for those suggestions. I think we we do do some of that, if that's what we're calling cognitive behavioral therapy. I always think a therapist needs to do that. A lot of deep, thoughts. Yeah. A, and your attitude and your, your self-talk. Absolutely. Okay. And and a lot of deep breathing just to, to bring the anxiety down. Right. So I love that. Thank you for adding that in. And in our Paving the Path to Wellness, which is in the self-care book, one of our steps, which is not part of the lifestyle medicine yet, is attitude. And in attitude, we talk about growth mindset where we tell ourselves, oh, that was a mishap, but how can I learn and grow from it? And, and thinking about gratitude and, and a little bit more in that realm, I think, that you're talking about, which is so powerful. And, and thank you for bringing that up. And then behind. Could you uh, comment a little bit about consumption of a coffee and the tea? Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yep. Great question. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is about coffee and tea. Great question. So caffeine, we learned so much about different drugs, right? Pharmacokinetics. Does anyone know what receptor caffeine binds to? Adenosine. Okay. Give this lady a book. Did you already get one? Yeah. But now does anyone know what that is? Why do I care about the adenosine receptor? Yeah, so this is critical. We don't know this as physicians. We weren't taught this. So we need to teach the medical students. I do my best to teach them. So throughout the day, we use ATP and then adenosine builds up. By 11 p.m., we have a, our highest amount of adenosine. That's terrific because adenosine will help us signal sleep, fall asleep. So we want adenosine. Now, why did I talk about caffeine? Because it binds to the same receptor as adenosine and it has a half-life of four to six hours. Now, someone will always say, especially again, the European crowd, and look, I'm part Greek. My, my grandparents immigrated from Vassara, Greece, and, and we're here, and I'm, I'm part of a big Greek family, so I can say this. So with the Europeans, they will say, yeah, but but I have a cappuccino espresso at 10 p.m. and I sleep like a baby. And, and, <laughs> and, I, mean, and, and, and I mean, that may be, that may be for them, right? That, that, that could be, but the average metabolism Right, is four to six hours. The average person, if you drink your caffeine, and, and what's recommended is two to three cups, and I'll get to that in a, in a, in a minute. If you have that at 3 p.m., watch. By 6 p.m., that's 9 p.m., half of your adenosine receptors will be taken up. I mean, I, I'm sorry, half, half of the caffeine is still in your system taking up your adenosine receptors, right? As a half-life of six hours. You consume it. At three, give six hours to nine, half of that is still in your system. So you have to be careful when you consume it, number one. Most people recommend no consumption after noontime. I personally recommend no consumption after 10. If you have trouble with your sleep, then 8 a.m. or you take it off gradually, of course, because we know there's withdrawal symptoms. Now, Frank Hugh, I was just with him. You may know him. He's the new chair of the Division of Nutrition or Department of Nutrition at the School of Public Health. He took over from Walter Willett. He was on the Dietary Guidelines Committee 
from 2015 to 2020. And he was just telling me as we were having our coffee before the Thich Nhat Hanh event that he was proud that he got caffeine into the dietary guidelines as something that you can consume. So you know it's got phytonutrients and antioxidants and it can be healthy for some, for most. Limited though, limited. Two to three cups is what on average. You'll see research that says, oh, you can have eight cups. Okay, let's 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 look at the, the a lot of the data over a long period of time, and you'll see it's about two to three cups. Now, do some people get anxious, stressed, and increased heart rate with caffeine? Ah, uh, absolutely. People with AFib is that a a danger? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that you, you know high blood pressure. There are certain individuals that you need to really monitor the caffeine. Um, but mostly, by the way, I also talk to people and they say, "Oh, I don't have to worry about this. I have Diet Coke." No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. So there's caffeine, of course, in, in Coke um, and in Mountain Dew and in, in many things apart from apart from coffee. So did that help to answer about caffeine when you said talk about caffeine? Or, or is there another question I can answer regarding caffeine specifically? If I don't drink any coffee, is that problem? No, nope. no, nope. no one has said that. No. Yeah. And tea, by the way. Right. So so. Chamomile tea, talking about sleep, that is, it could potentially help you. And that's no really good randomized control trials, but but some some herbal tea, if you're having trouble with sleep, that may help. What we're trying to do is get people off the wine and put even have a glass of you know or, or a mug of chamomile tea instead of that wine to help people fall asleep. So there's other research that says if you drink cherry juice tart, unsweetened at night, that could help you fall asleep. So instead of putting the wine in there, put that tart cherry juice in there because research has shown that that could increase urinary melatonin. So somehow cherry, cherry juice can be digested and, and help um, us with melatonin. Interesting. Mediterranean diet also helps with, with sleep, but um, it's, you know, I would, there's no recommendation Everybody should be drinking a cup of coffee a day or something like that. No. Green tea is quite good, but should you start drinking it? No. Yeah. Um, one thing about nutrition, um, I'm vegetarian. My whole family's vegetarian for yeah. my life. Um, yeah. The one thing, like my father, he went for a checkup a couple of years ago. He was deficient in B12. Yeah. I hear this like with a lot of people. Who are yes. How do you... You yes. Know. Yeah. So this is a great question and it's really important. So when you're vegan or vegetarian, or as I call myself, whole food plant predominant eating pattern, because I don't eat dairy or, or meat. So uh, you have to supplement with B12. Um, and you can do that in a variety of ways. Usually working with your healthcare provider is the first step to talk about it and get it tested and see if you actually need it IV or if you can do a supplement with with a tablet and then how often you'll do it. I'm not uh, connected to any supplement companies. Um, so I would recommend you ask your own physician what they would, what they would suggest, but you, there's that, that's, that's what we, we as people that don't eat the meat um, need to supplement. I yes. have quite a few questions from the online. Okay, let's go. Okay. And would you mind repeating them so they know that you're then you're answering that sure. question. So Mary asks, how are people with disabilities supposed to exercise? Any recommendations? Yeah, great question, because I, I still run stroke groups. Probably doesn't surprise you. So at Spalding since 2012, I've been running group lifestyle medicine visits for stroke survivors and their family members, and uh, they would fall into this category. So there are multiple ways that we have adapted sports at Spalding Rehab Hospital. So the first thing to do would be to go to a rehab hospital and to look into the adaptive sports equipment and classes and to work with a physical therapist. So that's you know what rehab does really well, physiatry, physical medicine rehab does really well, is help people who have disabilities to fully function and to be able to enjoy exercise. So uh, there's so, there's so many if they're weak on one leg or if they're weak in their hand or you know it will be or if they're paraplegic or so it's going to really vary on the disability and a related question to that tracy says her husband is a stroke survivor 
is doctor practices functional medicine. Mm. Can you explain what is the difference between lifestyle and functional medicine? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a really, really good question. And I, I have been involved in both worlds. In 2016, the Institute of Functional Medicine, the, the real leader there is Mark Hyman. You may have heard of him. Um, they, the difference, the main difference is they use lifestyle medicine. Quite frankly, everybody uses lifestyle medicine. It's a matter of how much do you understand it and can you prescribe it? And do you know short chain fatty acids? And do you, do you know, would you know the mechanisms of exercise? And do you understand how to progress someone? So someone who is new to fiber, you can't just say have 25 grams of fiber, there will be GI distress. It's sort of a start low, go slow thing with fiber. So they do that. And I helped them in 2016. I used to go to their annual conferences, their, their, their um, different conferences they have. They have modules. So for their exercise module, I would do their exercise work and help them create exercise prescriptions. So at this point, 2023, they have a full-on lifestyle medicine program, protocol. Uh, the difference is what we don't do and they do do. We don't do a lot of um, sensitivity testing, stool testing, um, allergy testing. We, we refer allergy testing out. And then they look for, in their blood work, they look for deficiencies uh, of a lot of different vitamins and nutrients. And then they have supplements and they prescribe those supplements. Um, what was harder for me at that time was I, I like getting the nutrients from food and I also don't like selling supplements from my office. And you didn't have to do that, but that was sort of part of the functional medicine. If you see a functional medicine doctor, you're likely gonna get a lot of different tests for the stool and the blood and they'll find deficiencies and then they'll they'll supplement it. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. I don't fully understand it or know how it works. I do, I, as I say, I just, the, we, we try to get as much as we can through food except for B12 vitamin D sometimes we will recommend, um, but there, there's a whole host of other supplements and combined supplements and, and it's complex. It's complex. And, and I, we don't do that. We're not trained in that. We're not trained in, in supplements. They are. Thank you. There's one last question. Okay. Wow. What's your opinion on OMAD, which I'm guessing is one meal a day? I, can you help? I'm not sure. It's Edgar's question. Maybe you can ask Edgar. Oh, Edgar, could you um, chat in a little more information about your question? And Tracy says, thank you. Uh, oh, good. That was very helpful to understand the difference. Okay, I'm so glad. I mean, we really believe, and I think anyone would, that, that lifestyle medicine should be part of every medical specialty especially endocrinology, cardiology, family medicine, pediatrics, internal medicine. I, I mean, I don't see where it doesn't fit, honestly. Yeah, yes, Nancy, so good to see you. So, oh, thank you so, so much for being here, Nancy. I really, really appreciate it. So Edgar is uh, explaining, he, what is your opinion on the health benefit of the one meal a day diet? Oh, so fasting, pretty much fasting, yeah. So that's a great question. We're going to have to see the data. So there's some interesting information and data about intermittent fasting right now. It's pretty compelling. And I've had physician patients and patients, patients, try intermittent fasting for weight loss. And they get good results. Yeah, over four weeks, they, they do get some good results with their intermittent fasting. The problem with it is it's hard to continue for more than a month two months. People find it very challenging. And then they just drop off and they go right back to the old way of eating. So the question is, how sustainable is it for someone? Most nutritionists, most registered dietitians, and most traditional um, counselors in nutrition would say three meals a day is the way to keep your blood glucose steady. That helps you so you don't go through the up and down spikes throughout the day um, and you don't drop your glucose too much. So I don't recommend one meal a day. I would look at the research if that's the way you really wanna go, Edgar. I, I think you should go into PubMed and look at one meal a day health benefits, look at intermittent fasting health benefits. Intermittent fasting isn't quite one meal a day. 
but um, I, I would I would investigate it. And I, I, would, I feel that there's just, I need to see more research, but I'm a research junkie. So I wanna see more data before I could say, definitely that's the way to go. But I'm also, if you're not having side effects and you're eating one meal a day and you're feeling great and you're doing it to lose weight or you're doing it to decrease inflammation or you're doing it for a specific reason and it seems to be controlling whatever the symptom or thing that is bothering you and you're functioning on it and you're not having lows during the day when it's 3 p.m., most of us feel low and lack of, of energy and, and lack of glucose and we've eaten lunch, but if, if you can have one meal a day and make it through the day, I mean, I would experiment with it personally, but I also would check in with my physician. I don't know what medications you're taking. I don't know. I don't know your history. I don't know if you have diabetes. So, I mean, it just makes me a little tiny bit uncomfortable not knowing everything, but I think it's something worth looking into. My goodness, thank you so much for your balanced answer. Um, and then last question from Dr. Megan, who says, what do you propose for those of us that take 24 hour calls? Yeah, it's a tough one, right? Well. First of all, you won't be doing that forever, correct? That eventually, right? So the good news is that goes away. In my day, MGH days, we were Q2 for internship, and that went away. So it was just a hard time in life. So 24-hour shift. If you can, I mean, it's really hard because you, you probably can't. But I mean, if you can get into that call room and get some shut-eye, really try to do it. But I... Yeah, you can't control it. So let's assume you're going to be up for those 24 hours. First thing is don't drive home. I fell asleep at the wheel at Stanford after surgery uh, rotation as a medical student. And I stayed up all night, impressed the surgeons. And, and I, I knew I shouldn't get behind the wheel. I was exhausted. But I said, ah, San Jose to Palo Alto. It's 20 minutes. I can do it. And then I can sleep in my own bed. And I found myself in an intersection. I had no idea how I got there. No one was injured, thank goodness. But this is a common story for residents and physicians that have 24-hour calls. So the first thing is take an Uber home, get a ride, or go into the call room and sleep. That's what I was going to do, and I didn't do it. So make sure not to drive after you've been up for 24 hours. That's number one. Number two, if you, if you, if you, if you, I, I, what's the rest of the call schedule? Do you have five, six days free after that, after the 24 on? Are you 24 on and then off for a period? Or are you 24 and, and then off for two days and back on for 24? I mean, there's a rhythm to this usually, right? Is it coming in or? He's here. But I okay. So. It's going to depend on if you are going to get a, a week of, of, of a regular circadian rhythm. And if so, you want to get back into that circadian rhythm. The, the thing is, it, you're going to be exhausted, so you may need that nap. And so take that nap. But the sooner you can get back into the routine of going to bed at 11, waking up at 7, going to bed at, or whatever it is for you, 12, 8, I don't know, 10, 6, whatever your rhythm is, soon as you can get back into that rhythm and stay in that rhythm and see the light. You want to get into circadian rhythm in the morning, see the light, make sure to block everything down at night and get into that rhythm again, the better off you'll be. And then also trying not to eat throughout the night. Now, again, you're on call. You may be hungry. I mean, this is a very hard time. It's a very hard time in life. So if you can stick to eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner at regular time frames, and going through the night like you would without, and then having your breakfast in the morning and sticking at least with a consistent meal plan, if you can, but see, look, if, if they're hungry at four and they're on call, I mean, you should eat. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an unusual time of your life where you're going to behave and have a lifestyle that is not necessarily the healthiest, but it's kind of what you need to do to get through. Like I couldn't recommend, oh, just sleep from 12 to, to, to eight and when you're on call. No, you can't recommend that. That's the optimal thing to do, but you're not gonna be able to do that. Try not to eat, but what if you're hungry? And look, you have to stay up. Well, what I did to stay up, I'll tell you the truth, I had coffee. That's what I did to stay up. Now, is that a smart thing to do now, to have coffee at 3 a.m.? No, no, we don't want to do that. But, but if you're on call, will you do that? Potentially, 
so you don't fall asleep in front of the patient. So does that help? I think it does, but I haven't heard. We that. haven't heard. Okay. They, yeah, she fell asleep. She was on call. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, okay. Thank you so, so much, everybody, for sticking with me, for, for being here in person and for being here online. I really, really appreciate it. I hope you like the books. Please give me feedback. And um, hopefully I'll see you again. Thank you so, so much. I just want to quickly oh. close and, and say thank you so much to Dr. Beth Freitas for sharing such a wealth of wisdom with us. And uh, I'm sure that uh, there are ways to connect with her. You can also email yeah. us and we can get you in connection if that's okay. Uh, and just very quickly, if you enjoyed this talk, we have monthly events on all sorts of different topics and our next event is happening uh, in May, on May 22nd, it's a Monday afternoon at one. It's on the neuroscience of mind wandering and meditation. So very connected to the stress resilience aspects of what Dr. Fadis talked about today in her uh, pillars of lifestyle medicine. And this is with Dr. Arnaud Delorme, uh, who, is an expert in mind wandering and neuroscience. So this is gonna be a really cool talk to participate in and you can scan the QR code or register using uh, this link. And then just very briefly connected to all of these aspects that uh, Dr. Fredis talked about, uh, we share tools to help with stress resilience and specifically yoga and meditation tools through our center with the wellness programs we do for patients with various medical conditions, as well as for physicians and staff members within our hospital system. So this is something that I wanted to share about is an opportunity for you all to refer as well as connect for yourself. And if you're interested in learning about opportunities like this, various studies that we're doing on these populations, um, as well as just connecting and being part of the know of when we're gonna have future speaker series, this is the easiest way to connect and be in touch and get the updates. You can just subscribe to our newsletter and you'll be the first to know about any upcoming events. Like in October, we have Harvard's very first consciousness conference where we'll have incredible guest speakers from all over the world joining us, including Steven Pinker and Sadhguru and uh, NIH director, Helen Langevin, Deepak Chopra, I'm sure all of you have heard of, Susan Bauer, Wu, Mind and Life Institute, Rudolf Tanzi, Alzheimer's expert, and many more prolific speakers talking about the impacts socially, scientifically, and spiritually of consciousness. So we're really excited to be hosting that and uh, stay in touch with us on social media and feel free to reach out to us anytime via email. Uh, if you have any feedback about how awesome this talk was, you can also email us about that so we can get Beth more involved with everything that we're doing at Sadhguru Center. And thank you all so much for spending your Friday evening with us. Take good care. Please uh, take some inspiration from what Dr. Frady shared today and, and work on your own lifestyle a little bit. And please get in touch with us however you'd like so that we can also support you in the same. Thank you so much, everybody.